Welcome to the party. Here we are, just um, hanging out another day and um, waiting for people to come. In the meantime, let's put on some music in the background. Welcome to our guests. Feel free to join as a guest so we can start. Yo, everyone. Um, Cool, cool. Yeah, so um, if you guys want to join, now would be a good time. And by now, I mean in a few minutes. And by a few minutes, I mean now. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Welcome. Feel free to join. Have you ever been a guest on these shows before? I'll take that as a maybe, because, um, yeah, basically. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, if you've ever been a guest, feel free to be a, be a guest, if you ever know. I'm not sure if you've done these TikTok lives before, but they're good. It's good for the environment, deep down. Basically. So yeah, I mean, feel free to join. And by free, I mean um, expensive.
trying to set up some live stream recording, which may or may not work. Not sure how. Just click the accept button when I say invite. <laughs> you should say like a button that says accept. Just click yes. Sometimes all it's all it takes. Just to jump out. Basically. I tried to like record this in like five different ways, but I'm not sure if it's working. Basically. I tried to like record this in like five different ways, but I'm not sure if it's working. Come back. I see you just joined again. Here, many cell. Just um, in the bottom left, just click a you can click like a button that says um join, or just says it says guests. Basically, um, I'm trying to invite you manually as well, but I'm not sure why it's not working. Can't change my phone settings. Really? That's brutal. I'm trying to set up like different streaming and stuff. I don't know if you guys can see it. No, you can't. Because I have the background on. But um, <laughs> I have like a recording streaming from a different phone to YouTube, but it's not really working. But whatever. I mean, it's also recording it, but it's just better to have it um, streamed directly. Uh, welcome, Speakeasy. Long see no time. Hi, welcome. We're just trying to. I'm just trying to set up streaming, recording, and also get our guests on, so we can start. I'm trying to like stream from a different phone um, to YouTube while on this phone and sharing screens, etc. <laughs> so I could have like five different recordings at the same time, but it's not really working. But whatever, it's a free country. You get what you pay for. Um, in the meantime, maybe I'll put on some some audio. Yeah, just click the guests in the bottom left corner and it should work. Yo, welcome everyone. Debbie, here. You guys can join if you want as a guest. But, um, it's a good country. I should to invite people who I'm not friends with down here, but it's all good. Yeah, anyone who's just joining us, we're just joining the, we're starting the month of El Ul, the month of, um, of Divine Mercy. This is the month starting where Moses, Moses on Mount Sinai um, asked the creator of the universe to forgive the Jewish people for the um, sin of the golden cafeteria. The Jew Jewish people basically made this golden calf, which was an idol and bad. And then Moses prayed for forgiveness for the creator to forgive the Jewish people for the sin. And I think you need a thousand followers to go live. To start a live, you do, but to join a live, I think you can just join as anyone, I'm pretty sure. And by pretty sure, I mean very sure. And by very sure, I mean sure, because I've done it a few times. Yeah, you could join as a guest, but you won't be able to show your video unless you um, have a thousand of followers, which you can also um, buy, technically with third-party websites, which is what I did, partially. Um, and that's what, like, most people do. But you should be able to just click the, the guest button in the bottom left to start out, hypothetically. Um, yeah, basically. 
And in that other studio, by the way, if we would have done Facebook Live, it would have worked because they allow you to select a custom um, device. So the next time, theoretically. Um, but Facebook doesn't, Live doesn't really work for TikTok because TikTok, you could like have random guests and stuff that just like discover you. So it's kind of has that advantage. Mr. Can you see how you do it again? Bottom left of your screen, there's a button that says guests. It should say, or add as a gift. Maybe the bottom left of the thousand, you just buy them. I don't know if I could say it because it might be. Go to Etsy or something and just look up buy thousand followers or something. And you could buy them. But it takes like a couple hours to process. But you could get you could join as a guest without without buying them. You just um click the guest button. It just won't show your video until you have the subscribers. But you don't need the video to start out. Lesson learned. <laughs> oh yeah, lesson lesson learned. I, I guess there's a little delay because I guess things I'm saying might be in a long island right now. Oh nice. That's why long distance TikToking is good once in a while. Um, I'm trying to like stream it on like 50 different devices at once as we speak. Um, that's not really working because I don't know my internet's not working. I like it. Make for interesting content. Cool, cool. Yeah, I tried to record it. Um, it, it records by default, but the problem is that when it records by default, then it doesn't show the other people talking if they don't have their video on. So I'm trying to set up different kind of streaming where it records it and it shows them. Um, okay. Maybe the other people should do it. I want to be able to basically record the screen itself as opposed to just do the default records. I had to download an app <laughs> um, that that like live streams from your Android device to YouTube. It doesn't let me. It's brutal. What do you mean it doesn't let you? It doesn't just. That's brutal. Um, <laughs> here, when I click invite, when I try to invite you, what happens? Just nothing. Because I've, I've done it with Shia. And he made an account like a few minutes before and it let him do it. Are you banned right now or are you not banned? It's brutal. Welcome people to the party. Trying to like stream on YouTube for this. Um, what, is it, what do you mean it doesn't let you? What does it show? Like, I can't. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. I click invite. I clicked invited to you. So you should be invited, hypothetically. So that's a start. Um, but I'm not sure what else happens after that. Yeah, I'm trying to like stream th five different things at the same time. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are just joining us, feel free to join us as a guest. We're talking about how. In the month of Elul, the king, which is the creator, is in the fields, accessible to everyone. We just started the month of Elul right now, and um, usually we talk about Elul, or usually we talk about a king of flesh and blood, or in general, and the king is, is in the fields. Uh, no, no, usually a king is in the palace, which is away from the fields, exclusive not accessible to everyone. But nowadays, in the month of Elul, it's metaphorically speaking as if the king of the universe is in a field, and not out in the, not in the palace, but he's out, where it's accessible to everyone to greet his face. Um, so, historically speaking, in the month of Elul, this is the month where, where Moshe, Moses, went up onto the mountain to ask forgiveness for the Creator, for the Jewish people, after the Jewish people sinned by worshipping this golden calf. And Moshe was up on Mount Sinai for 120 days and nights, almost straight. So, um, in the third set of 40 days and 40 nights, which is when the Creator was basically forgiving the Jewish people, and that was on the first day of El, And that's when Moshe started receiving the second set of tablets, which included the Talmud, etc. But, on this day, the first day of Elul, is um, after the. I think it's, I think it's after the Creator t 
told Moshe these 13 attributes of divine mercy. I forgot historically what day they were set on exactly, if they were at the end of the 40 days, but at least this these second set of 40 days and 40 nights is in connection with the idea of the Creator's mercy. Um, in the process of the Creator forgiving the Jewish people, the Creator tells Moshe 13 ways that he forgives everyone for their sins. And it says anytime these 13 traits are mentioned before him, especially in a minion, then the Creator will forgive everyone for the sins that they did. Um, if, so the point is that these 13 attributes of, of mercy are associated with the mother of Elul. That's the time that Moshe heard them. I forgot the exact date that he heard them, if it was in the beginning or at the end, but Elul is connected with the time that he heard them. So, also, the Torah is eternal. So just like Moshe had the time of divine mercy during the month of Elul, which is the time the Creator forgave all the Jewish people for what they did, so too, um, when it comes to all times, the, uh, during the month of Elul, every year, it's a time of divine mercy. And um, in, in the book of the Kutei Torah, in the book that's written by the, um, by the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad Chassidus, he explains the month of Elul in an analogy of um, a king who, before going to the palace, first stops by in a field to greet all of the people in the field. Again, usually a king is um, in his own palace. People can't really get to him. But during the month of Elul, the Alter Rebbe explains um, the king is accessible for everyone to greet him, and everyone is able and permitted to greet the king. And the king greets everyone that goes to him with a smiling face, basically. So that idea of the king greeting everyone who goes to him is associated with the 13 attributes of divine mercy that happened during the month of Elul. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to... So, in the Kutai Torah, basically, it, ex it explains this concept that the verse in Song of Songs says, I am for my beloved, and my beloved is to me. And in Hebrew, that is, that, the Hebrew words of that, which is, Ani Ladodi, Madodi Li, I am for my beloved, my beloved is to me. The, the first letter of each of those words spells out the Hebrew month of El Ul. So, basically, the idea, it explains the discourse of the idea of when it says, I am for my beloved. But, but, but by, the way, by the way, this is a, from a discourse from the Bavish Rebbe in 1972, but it's also based on the Alter Rebbe's um, discourse, which was in the 1700s. So it's, when, when it says, I am for my beloved, that refers to what's known as an awakening from below. In other words, sometimes a person can be in a situation in life where they're not really uh, inspired or they don't really feel a, they don't really feel an uh, open connection to approach the Creator, but rather because of their own free will, they just decide to put in the effort to to greet the Creator on their own, and then they they do what they just do different things. They, they start doing the mitzvahs, they start doing whatever they need to do to greet the Creator. So that is known as an awakening from below because it comes from the effort of people of humanity. It does not come from above because before it happened. They didn't have any inspiration to approach the Creator. So that's an awakening from above. And that is alluded to in the, in the first part of the verse that says, I am for my beloved. But then the second part of the verse says, my beloved is to me. That refers to what's known as an awakening from above, which means even if someone does not want to approach the Creator, not only are they not inspired initially, but they also don't even want to approach the Creator at first. But the Creator is the one who approaches them. And it's like a, a, so to speak, a calling from above, from the heavens, reaching out to the soul of a person, inviting them to go closer. I think of it like a phone call. Like the first way is like you're calling the creator. The creator could answer, could not answer, but he chooses to answer. And the second way is that the creator is calling you. And you have to have the free choice to, to answer that. So that's the idea of my beloved is to me. So essentially, all of these ideas are... are because on the... Because I'm... Um, Anyway, here's our first guest. Hi, nice to meet you. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. What's up? What's up? 
Nothing much, just watching your live. I appreciate you uh, doing what you do. Cool, 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 cool. All right, let's see. I figured. Right, see, I figured. Just invite people up. Have any questions? Have any questions? Even if they don't have any questions, have any questions just, I guess. I guess. But yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I'm just surprised how many people. Do you have any questions? By any chance? Yeah, I do. That's cool. You know, how many, cool. you know how many times it says like they? we shouldn't follow it? The question's like this. Why when it comes to a man um, taking care of his bodily hair, right? If he wants to, let's say, shave his armpits or uh, trim somewhere else. Why does it, why do we rely on the customs of the city which is mostly going to follow the minchag of what they are doing, we should do. We're obviously not talking about Yidim, right? We're talking about the majority of the people in the area where we live. So here in New York City, most of the men are shaving their arms, legs, whatever. So that gives us a shoot to, to do it too then? Like, why are we following what the Goyim are doing? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of this. Law. I'm not aware of this. Law. Much. I think you have an echo, by the way. Well, I mean, I think you have an echo, by the way. I apologize. And actually, I know that you have an echo because I can hear myself. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mean, now you're muted, so there's no echo. But yeah, I have no idea what the custom is about that. Um. Basically. So yeah. I don't so, know. Yeah. I don't know. It's not the first time we follow, like, you know, even like during Pesach, we eat the afikoman. That's not even a, that's a Greek word. Or, uh, you know, when we have the Brit Mila, and then you have the Moel, and then you have the Sandak. What is a Sandak? That's literally Godfather in Greek again. Like, why are we using these terminologies, Tafikoman, the Sandak? Why? These are not even Judaic terms. These are Moshe. Moshe never heard these terms. Um, I don't know. Why not? Why not? Sometimes it's good to it's good to elevate the secular. Secular. Sometimes no. secular. Sometimes we're, secular we're, 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 we're supposed to be separated from them. We're not supposed to assimilate with them or use their terminology you know right, like right. even when you have the blue humash right you have the shot sign humash you open it up and over there you see bereshit and then you see slash genesis why is okay. it called okay. you get what i'm are saying you asking, like, are you asking me or are you asking no i'm asking you a general question it's like to, to, to all you them like why are we I saying that we don't follow uh, we're not supposed to follow the goyish world but then yet yeah, we we have all these terminologies in our in our holy torah we have the whole entire thing has been translated into greek or you know you even using these you know from the five books we use their terminologies like genesis deuteronomy leviticus like why i think you have an echo by the way oh you, okay you muted um I mean, not only that, but the Jews also use the chapter numbers that the, the non-Jews, the chapters of the Tanakh, I think were not made by Jewish sources, but we use them. Um, I mean, we could also say, like, why do we speak English? You know, we could also just only speak um, Hebrew all the time. Um, but I don't know. You know, why not? Even even Yiddish is just like German and stuff. Um, so, yeah. So maybe we should just speak Hebrew. Maybe we just shouldn't speak at all. But I don't know. There's a concept of, like, elevating the secular world also. Like, um, some parts of the Torah... Are written in Aramaic. There's several parts of the five books of Moses that have Aramaic writing in them. Um, in the Kutei Torah, in the, like some Kabbalah book, it said it explained one time. I have to find this reference though. But in the end of the Torah, it says, "Hashem Sanai." It says, "The Asa may Rivavos Kodesh." He came with like many myriads of holy angels, but the word "He came" Asa is not Hebrew. That's an Aramaic word and um it explained that the idea of hashem giving the torah with and i, I think the fact that he, the fact that when he says he, when he came he came to mount sinai means that he um 
that was after Hashem offered the Torah to the other nations, but they d- denied it. And then he came back from the other nations to give it to the Torah to the Torah to the Jewish people. So I don't remember all the details, but the, something something to do with the fact that the way the Torah uses the word Asa, which is Aramaic, alludes to the fact that um, that w- one of the ideas of the Torah is to elevate the seventy languages. So maybe that's related, but who knows? I thought having more than Lashon Kodesh was a downgrade because these languages only appeared because of the head of the Tower of Babel. So when Mashiach comes, we're only going to speak Lashon Kodesh. So we're going to go back to a singular language. Maybe. Um, it says Lashon, it says Safa Barua. It says in um, one of the verses, one of the prophecies, I forgot where, but it says, um, Hashem will transform all, everyone um, to call out in one pure language that Rashi says is Lashon Kodesh. But, um, yeah, I mean, that can mean Hebrew. That can also mean just in whatever language people speak, they'll only use holiness. So, um, I don't know, we'll see. Well, what does that, that mean? mean? <laughs> I don't know. Were you going to say something? It's definitely not going to be Yiddish or English. Who knows? I mean, we'll find out when it happens. Rashi says Lashon Kodesh. But um, that sounds like it's Hebrew, but we'll see. I mean, Aramaic existed since before the Tower of Babel. Not only Aramaic, but Many languages existed before the Tower of Babel. It says in the verses explicitly, before the Tower of Babel, the people were split up according to their languages. And then later they decided to only accept one language upon themselves. And then it was they were scattered again to have many languages. But um, there's in the Talmud, you show me in the Sanhedrin, it says that Adam, the first man, actually spoke Aramaic. Um, I'm not sure if he spoke any other languages as well, or just Aramaic. So yeah. But that's something at least. I mean, I'm sure he spoke every language, whatever language was available. He saw from the beginning till the end of humankind. So right. he knew he knew languages that you and I don't know. Yeah, I guess. But yes. you know, here, even now, look at the all the months. Right, we're now in Elul. We had Av. Tammuz, whatever it is, these are all uh, Persian. These are all months that were added by Ezra. These are not months that Moshe Rabbeinu knew. Everything in the Torah is Chodesh, Rishon, Chodesh, <clears throat> Shini, like this, you know? First month, second month, seventh month. There is no words about Elu or uh, Adar. What's that? Yeah, maybe. Is that on my end or your end? I think I, I, perhaps I should log out and log back in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, who knows? All right, here we are back in business. Um, so yeah months different languages so yeah i mean i don't know it's interesting like the hebrew name of the hebrew month is um i guess el i don't know if el is even hebrew i don't think it is but there's still deeper meanings associated with it. yeah welcome back yeah welcome back okay is it better now for now no i'm just holding my phone in my hand and speaking like you i mean just don't want to turn the camera on. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, 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 I don't know. Um, in the sense of the one language, the um, the whole issue with the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel was that they were also looking for the singul- singularity. Because they all were uh, like one, you know, uh, conglomerate of people in one mission to build this tower. And so, you know, the singularity in Rashi says like they were mourning the brick over the person who fell from, you know, the top over there. I don't know how far it went, but it took months i guess for them to bring up one brick up there and when it fell with the person they were mourning the brick over the people so 
So, it's harsh. It's harsh. I mean, I'm sure you've read it. I haven't read that specific, read that specific part. part. The 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 mm-hmm. It's in the. It's actually in the bottom of the. You know, the commentaries in the blue homage. I don't know which cool, homage. Cool. He probably cool, used cool. Uh, a Chabad homage, like a Lubavitcher Rebbe homage. Yeah, once in a while. Yeah, once in a while. Um, oh, um, I'm just saying, it's like that's yeah, the customary. Yeah, customary. Yeah, customary. <laughs> yeah, dude, the echo's a big problem. I don't know what to say. Um, I'm not sure why it is, but um, yeah, yeah. Many sellers in the comments. Yes, I have heard that debatably. Was it actually a spaceship though, or was it just something like that they wanted to? get to the moon with but not necessarily a ship but i don't know i mean oh, to just fly. the common to fly. on what mendy's writing here out of earth we're, we're we're unable to leave earth because of the rakia it says it right there in Birishit. so no one has ever left the earth no really no no how can we this is a we're in a locked environment that was the whole point of the tower of Babel. they were trying to go they were trying to pierce through the rakia to wage war with hashem this it was impossible is earth earth, earth flat well as the torah is describing it we we are basically a plate with a bowl over us a dome that's what it's that's how Nowhere in the Torah does it say that the earth is a sphere. What does it say that it's a plate? What does it say that it's a plate? Right in Bereshit, it says it's a... It's Where? A, Where? I don't know the exact pasuk, but even when you read the hill, and okay. King David says from the four corners of the earth, how can you have corners when you have a sphere? Well, how can you have how corners, you have corners in a plate? Again, you can have corners if you, if you look from the, from the top down, they're invisible corners, they call them, if you look at a plate. But so on a sphere, it's a sphere. It's a sphere I guess, but it's it's more tangible if it's a flat, if it's more of like a 2D rather than a 3D. I don't know. I don't think that I don't think that the Earth is a sphere in the sense of it being like we want it to, to be like the sun or the moon. But I don't think the Earth is moving either. They say the mm-hmm. earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour. Those are different things. Yeah. We're like in a snow, little snow globe, you know, those little balls that people shake around and it looks like there's water and, uh, sn- you know, snow inside of it. I don't know what they call them, slow, snow globes. So that's how we how are. Say again, please. How do you, how do you know this is true? Uh, this is just my my observance. I, I this is what I think. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying this is what I think is true. It's my opinion. But from the Torah, okay. we definitely have what's called the rakia, right? Well, the rakia just turns out around. No, that oh, separates yeah, the upper yeah. waters and the lower. Yeah, that goes to unbearable. You got to fix the echoes now, dude. I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, Okay, he left on his own. I'm not sure what that was about, but um, <laughs> now the Torah is definitely, according to the Torah, the Earth is definitely round, like a globe. It's in the Zohar explicitly, which is accepted by all of Judaism, and um, yeah, basically that's that. Um, so if anyone wants to join as a guest again, they can. So again, um. Let's get back to the subject at hand, which was the Elul. So he mentioned that some of the Hebrew months are not always in Hebrew. There are other languages, but they still have significance because even though I don't think Elul is a Hebrew word, but um, but it says in the Hasidus and the Kabbalah teachings that the letters of that month name of the name of the month spell out the acronym for for um, a verse in the Song of Songs. So there's still holiness to them, even if they're from other languages as well, once they're accepted by the Jewish people. Um, 
So again, the month of Elul has um, the idea of I'm for my beloved, my beloved is to me, which is both the awakening from below, which is based on human efforts to approach the creator on their own, and the creator calling out to the people from above to below. So first, in the discourse from the Kutei Torah, from the al Jabi, first it says that the idea of Ani Ladodi, of I'm for my beloved, that refers to how the Jewish people approach the creator during the month of Elul. But then it says during the month, during the times of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that refers to how the Creator is approaching the people from above to below. Um, for whatever reason, which doesn't really explain, but um, I guess it's the time of like the closeness to Hashem. It says anyone who calls out to Hashem in those days, it says it's like they'll be answered immediately. It's, for example, it says like. Um, even one person praying to Hashem during those days is like the equivalence of a minion of people praying during the rest of the year. So like the time of the of between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are like days of, of divine um, will. Or it's like, it's easier to be close to the Creator as well. So I guess that's part of the explanation for why the idea of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the idea of my beloved is to me. But then this is all an explanation for how the month of Elul has both parts in it. it has the parts of I am for my beloved and my beloved is me so the discourse from 17, 1972 asks like why is it that both of these ideas both the my to my beloved and the beloved is to me is in the month of Elul if it says really that just the idea of I am for my beloved is Elul but the rest of it is um, Shana and Yom Kippur and it explains so this is like the discourse in the Rebbe which is explaining the discourse from the altar, it is, so that explains that the reason for this because why is it that in Elul, even though people are approaching the Creator on their own, it's still the idea of my beloved is to me. Because in Elul, it's a time of the revelation of the 13 attributes of divine mercy. As we explained, that that's a time that Moshe went up to the mountain to ask forgiveness. Um, that started on the first day of Elul. So during Elul is a time of the divine mercy. And um, it explains in the, the Kutit Torah that the revelation of the 13 attributes of divine mercy that are in Elul are to each and every one, even to those who are very, very far away, so to speak, from the Creator. Um, and that's, that's the language that he uses in another discourse from the year 5700, page 166. It says, even those who are very far away, which is kind of a strange language to use, doesn't usually say that in Chassidus, but it does here um, when explaining that. And then it continues to so so now then it continues to explain in um in the Likutei Torah from the Al Jerebi the what what is an analogy to explain the idea of the thirteen attributes of divine mercy? It says this is similar to a king that before he comes to a city, the people of the city go out to greet him and receive the king's face in the field that's outside the city. And then all those people are able and permitted, anyone who wants to, um, to greet the king is allowed to greet the, greet the king. And the king greets each and every one of them with a beautiful face, and he shows a smiling face to all of them. So this is an analogy to explain the idea of the 13 attributes of divine mercy that are shining openly in the month of Elul. But then... The Rebbe goes on to question this, that in the tour, um, which is a book of Jewish law, it says that in, from, the, from the beginning of Elul, from the first day of Elul, and onwards, we blow the shofar, a ram's horn, which is a yeah, ram's horn trumpet, um, every day in order to um, encourage the people hearing it to do teshuva, which is, so to speak, out of fear. When you hear because it says in a verse... In um, the book of Amos, chapter 3, it says, If a shofar, if a, if a horn, if like a ram's horn will be blown in the city, will the people not be terrified of it? So during the month of Elul, we blow the shofar in order to um, elicit like this kind of, so to speak, fear of the Creator, like an awe, in order to encourage people to do teshuva, to return to the Creator. But now we're saying, look at the Torah, that really during the month of Elul, is a time of the 13 attributes of divine mercy, which is seemingly the opposite of fear. 
Um, so, because it says, as it continues by the Rebbe's discourse, 1972, it says that seemingly since in Elul, it's as if the king is greeting each of them with a beautiful face and showing a smiling face to each and every one of them, then the main idea of Elul, seemingly, is is not fear, but love, love of the king, and the fact that the king is going out to greet them. People um, greet the king out of love, and the king is like greeting them out of love, but not fear, seemingly. And um, so that seems, seems to be a contradiction to the tour, which is another book of Jewish law. And also, when we talk about doing teshuva, returning to the creator, the simple meaning of the tour is that they blow the shofar in order to get people to fear the creator to return to him. But it says, um, based on the Kutu Torah, which is the El is the time of the attributes of divine mercy, it says that seemingly the idea of the returning to the creator in the month of El should be from love because it's the time of mercy. So why do we blow the shofar during the month of El in order to, um, to awaken fear and terror? Because how could fear and love be together at and what? How could fear and mercy, fear and love be together as one? one? And this is the Rebbe's own words explaining why we blow the shofar in Elul to elicit fear and terror, while at the same time Elul is a time of divine mercy, which implies love. So, the, so now, um, so he's explaining what exactly is love and fear. It's not necessarily what we think it is. Some of the differences between love and fear is that what is love? Love is something that comes from a revelation of light from above to below. It's saying this is the idea of what love is. Not necessarily saying that love is good and fear is bad, but it's like they're just two different ways of relating to, to, to the creator. It says love comes, this is like a general, a blanket statement. He's not saying like in general, he's saying like just a blanket statement. Love is something that comes from, from revealing light from above. You have something that's from above to below that's like calling out to you, not something that someone's working on on their own. It's like something that's being called out from somewhere else, a revelation of light from above, from some place that's beyond where a person is. But fear comes, speaking in incoherent abstractions. Here, what's up? Do you want to um, join me in the panel to talk about this? Mr. Um, TX Vanquisher in the comments. Incoherent abstractions. Not sure what you mean by that. <laughs> Does anyone understand what we're talking about? Again, just to clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about in the month of Elul, which is tonight, the first day of the last month of the Hebrew year, it's the time um, of divine mercy. So this is the time where the Creator forgave the Jewish people for worshiping the golden calf. And it says during this time, it says this was a, the last set of 40 days and 40 nights that Moshe was on the mountain, Mount Sinai, when the Creator forgave, gave the Jewish people, and the Creator told Moses 13 ways that he forgives people. So also every year, that idea of, every day, idea of the Torah is eternal. So that, just like it happened originally, a long time ago, the mercy that happened, the divine mercy of forgiving everyone, happens in Elul as well. And in the book of Likute Torah, from the Altar, Altar Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, it explains this idea of the 13 attributes of divine mercy in Elul, um, as being an explanation for why it's the verse in the, in the Song of Songs says, I am for my beloved and my beloved is to me. And that's the acronym of those Hebrew letters spells out in Hebrew. Ani Ladoni Ladoni Li spells out the Hebrew month of Elul, which is, means that in Elul we have both the idea of I am for my beloved, which is like an awakening from below when people choose to greet the Creator on their own, from below from below to above it's like they 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 don't have any reason to approach him other than they want to make their own effort to approach the creator and at the same time there's the idea of my beloved is for me where the creator is the one who's calling out to them which is so to speak like a revelation from above where it's like the creator like a telephone call one way you could call someone they could choose to answer or not or they could call you and you could choose to answer so excuse me so the idea of um my beloved is to me is like the creator calling out to us, but it explains how, but first it says that really during the time of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, that's the time of the creator calling out to us. Cause that's the time when the creator is close to everyone. It says anyone who even like one person who prays during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is as if an entire minion, as, as, as if like 10 people are play, praying to the creator. So at the time of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is like a really close time. So that's considered my beloved is to me. 
But it says that in the Kutta Torah that also in Elul we have the idea before Rosh Hashanah, the preparation meeting, we also have the idea of my beloved is to me. Even though generally in Elul it's the time of us doing Teshuva, returning to the Creator on our own, but we still have the idea of the Creator approaching us during Elul because it's the revelation of the 13 attributes of divine mercy which shine just like they shone originally when the Moshe was on the mountain during this time based on Moshe's prayers. They also shine every single year during this time of year. And it says an analogy to understand those 13 attributes of divine mercy is like as if a king, instead of being in this palace away from everyone else, it's as if, as if a king is going in the fields or on his way back to a city from a big trip. And the people of the city go out into the field to greet the king, and the king greets everyone with a smiling, you know, with a nice smiling face. So that's the idea of the 13 attributes of mercy during the month of Elul. And because the king is out in the field and accessible, even though he's not actually calling the people directly, but since he's in the place where the people usually are, that's also considered the idea of my beloved is to me. That's also considered a certain sense of the creator calling out to us, even though it's not like directly calling out to us, but it's like the king is just there in the field. So he's not actually going to us. It's like he's going to the place that we are, but we still have to be the ones to approach the creator on our own initiative. So even the fact that the creator is making himself accessible, that's also the idea of my beloved is to me. So now it's explaining that this idea of the, of the mercy in the month of El seems to contradict what it says in the book of Jewish law in the tour that we will the chauffeur a ram's horn in the month of Elul to, so to speak, scare people to do, to return to the creator, to wake them up out of fear and terror, so to speak. So how is that compatible with what we're saying now that the king is greeting everyone with mercy, which implies love. Mercy is seemingly the same thing as love, which is seemingly not the same thing as fear. But now this is the Rebbe's explanation in a discourse from 1972 um, from the part of, of Shoftim, he's explaining that um, that when we talk about love and fear, it's not necessarily like when not it's not necessarily what we think. Like love is like closeness to someone. It's like both love and fear are similar, but they just have some technical difficulties that distinguish between them. It says that the definition of love means something that comes as a revelation of light from above someone, meaning like. Someone doesn't like, it's not something that's initiated from oneself. It's like something that comes from some other place that's beyond a person. Um, so it's like the creator calling out to them from above, but not necessarily someone approaching the creator or their own initiative. But it says the idea of fear is something that mainly comes through one's own initiative and one's own service. So like, in other words, the difference between love and fear is love is something that one does not um, work on on their own which is kind of counterintuitive to other resources, but it, 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 it explains it. It's saying, um, I guess there's a lot of different um, meaning behind this, but saying at least, at least what we're saying here is we're saying that love is not something that comes from one's own service, but love is something that comes from a place that's beyond a person. It's like a, something that's called out to a person from above. But fear is something that mainly comes through one's own divine service. So, and it says this is similar to the fear of a king of flesh and blood, which is, related, which is related to this week's Torah portion, which talks about the commandment in the Torah to appoint a king in the people of Israel. And this, this discourse is during the month of Shoftim and this part of Deuteronomy chapters of starting in chapter 16 and 17 that talks about the commandment in the Torah to appoint a king. So... Now this discourse is bringing our part, our section of the Torah as an analogy to explain that. It says, this is, an, this is similar to the fear of a king of flesh and blood. That the fact that people of a city fear the king is because those people accepted on their own that that king should be a king over, over them. So the fact that the king is accepted by people, that's something that's through the service of of, of, of the people of the country because they accept the king upon themselves, which is their own divine service, or which, which is their own service. Let's talk about a king of flesh and blood. The fact that they accept the king on themselves, that is what causes the fear of them. And it says that in, in note nine, it says the, the proof of that is that a king that's from another city, which the people did not appoint that king, that king, the people don't have any awe or fear of that king. I mean, nowadays we don't really have kings, so we can't really like um, 
understand the idea of a king as like a spiritual mentor kind of thing. Back in the day, a king was not just like a military figure, but the king was like a, a spiritual leader who would like um, in, implant like the, the awe and the recognition of the creator within the nation based on the piety of the king. So it's like if people appoint like a, a king upon themselves, then they have a certain awe of him. But if there's a different king, even if he's also a king with valid traits of what, what is a proper king, if, if the people did not appoint the king over themselves, then they don't fear the other king from a different city. So the idea of fear is something that comes in their own divine service. And it says, because um, accepting kingship of, is through the nation, like it says in our week's partial, you, you shall place upon yourselves a king. So since Elo is the idea of I am for my beloved, which is the idea of our own divine service, that's why we need to have fear, which is through the chauffeur, which is through the chauffeur bus. The idea of fear is the idea of something that happens from our own initiative. Hi, welcome. Hello. 3M41D. It's Hi, like Emerald, but with a three and a four. Isn't that clever, dude? <laughs> I didn't think about that. Are we talking Emerald. kings? Not a king? Oh. <laughs> we were talking about kings, but um, we weren't look, reading Malachim. We were talking about um, a discourse from the Lavachir Rebbe in 1972, which is a commentary on um, the book of Song of Songs, mm. verse, um, verse Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 3, which is also related to the Parsha of the Torah called Parsha Shoftim, which starts in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and 17, that talks about appointing a king upon oneself and how that's related to the first day of the month of El, which is what we're in right now. Interesting. For one thing, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, very sexual book, like, oh my gosh. But also you can like read it as a sort of God, Hashem's love for his people and stuff. But very sensual book, dude. very interesting, interesting stuff. But then again, Shlomo had like a thousand wives, so makes sense. And then let's see, yeah. Deuteronomy 16. Let me, oh, bro, the Passover, dude. Yeah, that's some cool stuff. Passover, Passover. I'm not sure if Passover. Is that what it's talking about, Deuteronomy 16? It says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover for the Lord your God. In the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night, and you shall offer Passover sacrifice. Well, that's the beginning of the chapter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, our Parsha, Parsha Shop team starts in, um, we're trying to find it, starts like in the middle of the chapter. Yeah, when um, it talks about exactly. Rosh Hashanah verse. and Fakat. No, it starts in verse, chapter 16, verse 18 is the beginning of our week's Parsha. And specifically, the part about kings is in, in chapter 17 um, in Omer. But yeah, the, the Parsha of this week, Shoftim, the, which is Judges, but it's not, it's not the book of Judges. It's, it's, it's Judges not the book of Judges, in right. the Torah, in the five books of Moses. A great book, by the way. Prayer. Shoftim is like one of the best in the whole entire book. It's so, it's a good book, man. Good book. Yeah, you very judgment. Shoftim and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with a righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Don't the rabbis take this to mean them? It could mean, I mean, the idea of a rabbi is um, usually to administer um, legal decisions, but not all rabbis are judges necessarily. There right. could be rabbis who are judges, and in that case, they would take it upon them. But mm. um, so it depends. So when you think of Mashiach, do you think of a judge? Do you think of a king? Do you think of a priest? What do you think of? Or do you think of the Rebbe? Maybe. Some people think of the Rebbe. I mean, yeah, Mashiach is going to be a judge and a king and a teacher as well. Right. What about priest? No or yes? Priest? Yeah, yeah. Is he all three or no? That's too much. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, because the there's priestly a lot. family. The priestly family is only from um, Aharon, from Aaron. Right, the Cohens. Right, right. Yeah, but, but Mashiach is going to be descended from Yehuda, so it's different. Right. I think there's talk about like the temple being rebuilt, and then there being a Kohen Hagadol again, like a high priest. That hasn't been a thing in a long time. Yeah. Well, it says the, the resurrection of the righteous is going to be immediately. So, I, I don't know. I heard the Lubav Shemit talking about it, so that the Aharon himself. Um, could be the great priest if he's right, right. Or like I've heard some like Israelis tell me, yeah, when Moshe comes back, you know, he's gonna like tell us what to do. He's gonna be like leading us again. It's like, oh, that's interesting, because yeah, there is that idea well, hmm? of the resurrection, of course. Yes, yeah, they're gonna come back. You know, it's gonna be um, they can tell us what they saw. Right. So, <laughs> if the Rebbe's Moshiach, 
where's the resurrection or aren't we waiting on the Rebbe to resurrect himself and then claim to be the Mashiach Ben David? I know, man, you'll have to ask um, someone who believes in that. Oh, you don't take the Rebbe as Mashiach? Not necessarily. I mean, I don't know, it could be, maybe. But, but you I are mean, Chabad, right? What does it mean to be Chabad is the real question. It means you're a Chabadnik. <laughs> oh, okay, now now I understand. Exactly. Chassidus, you're probably Chabad. Yeah? Yeah. But soon everyone will learn Chassidus. Right, Chassidus I've heard like, some like Chabad guys say that the Mashiach will actually preach Chassidus. Instead of like Zohar, he'll preach Hasidus. Yeah. Which is kind of like watered down Zohar a little bit. It's beyond the Zohar. Oh, you think? Hasidus Zoh- is like the essence of Torah. Zohar is the soul of Torah, but Hasidus is the soul of the soul. So it's like it, include- it includes the Zohar, but it's also beyond it. Does Hasidus get into the Kabbalah? I'm sure it does, right? This it, it uses Kabbalah. It itself. It's not exclusively Kabbalah, but it uses Kabbalah to um, explain itself. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes. How old are you, bro? How old am I? Um, as I checked, it's about 26, I think. Oh, you're 26? That would explain yeah. the beard. That's a full beard, bro. I hear you. I hear. Yeah. <laughs> it grows on you. What do you do for work? It grows on you. Wow. <laughs> So what do you do for work? I bring. I try to bring the redemption. Are you like a, a Rebbe? Um, I don't know. What do you mean by that? Like, would you consider yourself like a rabbi, not spreading a, the word? Not a rabbi. Welcome, Kosher Jay. How are you? What's up, Jay? Excellent. Excellent. Thank God. Welcome back. So yeah, yeah happy. You're Elbow, a rabbi, basically. but you're a Talmud Chacham, and you're a Chassid right. of the Rebbe. And you're a lamplighter, so that's the most important thing. I try to be. Hopefully, I actually am. We'll see. There you go. Where do the lamps lead? <laughs> Did he say lamplighter? He's a lamplighter. Yeah. yeah, usually a lamp, like a lamps on the ground at least, usually leads somewhere, right? Or you just mean like the lamp, as in Hashem, Torah? Look, look, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that the Tzaddik should answer, but I know he's very humble, so I'll say the Bainani. Should answer your question that we have. Uh, go ahead. You got smicha. No, you're not a rabbi. You got your smicha. Come on. I learned the smicha stuff. Um, I didn't like fully learn it. I didn't really get. I didn't really get tested yet. But <laughs> I, don't, I learned like material, most of the material at least. You know. Bro, okay. you just got called a tzaddik, bro. That's a good compliment, man. That's I guess. Awesome. Is it? Yes, yeah. dude. It's good to be a tzaddik. Yeah, lamplighters in the times of, um, I think it goes back to the times of the temple, at least the second temple, where they used to um, light lamps. I think it's only during the time of Sukkot they would light the lamps, maybe during the whole year. I actually don't even remember now at this point, kind of on the spot. Um, but yeah, they used to like, light lamps, basically. I forgot all the details, actually, so I'm not even going to say it. Do you remember, Coach? Wasn't, I was thinking more about uh, someone asked, I forget if it was the Rebbe Rashab, Oh, right, yeah. A rabbi about what's a chassid. And he said a chassid is a lamplighter. Wh- which rabbi right. was this question posed to? Do you remember? I can't recall, but he said a chassid basically understands that a person is a lamp. A person is ready to do for in mitzvahs and to live up to their full potential. So the job of a chassid is to light that lamp. They already have everything they need. They just need a little spark. And that's, that's what we need to do is to light people up. Light people on right. fire in real life and give them as an offering to Hashem. No, I'm kidding. That's horrible, dude. Right. Yeah, Coast, it again. yeah, I think it's from Yom Yom. It says that it's um, we heard or you heard it from Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Kishnerson, but he he was telling someone about it, a conversation he had with Rabbi Shav. So it's kind of both. Rabbi oh. Shav said it, but I think we know it from Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak. And then it says that a Chassid asked, "What is Rabbi? What is a Chassid?" Oh, okay, it is Rabbi Roshab, but we know the story from the... Yeah, so Chassid asked the Rabbi Roshab, which we know the story from the, from the sixth Rabbi, but it's about the Rabbi Roshab. What is a Chassid? And the Rabbi Roshab said, a Chassid is a street lamplighter. A street lamplighter has a pole with fire. He knows that the fire is not his own, and he goes around lighting all lamps on his route. The Chassid asked, but what if the lamp is a, in a desolate wilderness? The Rabbi answered, then too, one must light it. Let it be noted that there is a wilderness, and let the wilderness feel ashamed before the light. 
Interesting. Wow. Interesting. What an interesting little tale. <laughs> yeah. Of course, because it's like rabbinic. Of course, like he says, a chassid is a lamplighter, a street lamplighter. He knows that the fire isn't his, and then the kid or the other reb obviously goes, well, what if it's in the desert? It's like, of course. <laughs> exactly. exactly. This, this goes on. I could keep... It's not so long, but it's, it says, like, what if the lamp is in the middle of the sea? It said, one must take off one's clothes, jump into the water, and light it there. And that is a chassid? Very thought for a long moment said, yes, that is a chassid. <laughs> Interesting. It's almost... But Rebbe, I do not see the lamps. And he said, this is because you are not a lamplighter. Wow. Oh, you're reading the same place. I'm very... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where are yeah, you yeah. based? Right now I'm in New York, Crown Heights. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm very good friends with the Shem Tobes in Chicago, if you know them. They run the Chabad at the University of Illinois, Chicago, the UIC campus. I'm also very good friends with the Wolfs in Chicago. His father runs the Cheder, Cheder Lubavitch and Skokie. Um, Yitzchak Wolf, and his son Mendy Wolf. And uh, I don't know, maybe you know some of the Shlucham in Chicago. David Katlarski, Yosef Moskowitz. Sounds familiar. I mean, my main rabbi was Rabbi Yehi Zalmi Kudan. From, he's in Sim, Simcha Barber, they call it, or Santa Barber, California. Oh, wow. So I first found out Chabad. But before he came on Shlichus, he was actually in, in Chicago, and he worked in the Chicago school for a long time. Oh, um, uh, one time I was on the bus to, an, to the OHEL recently, and I was just randomly sat on the last seat available, and it happened to be next to the principal of like the main Jewish school in Chicago, and he used to work with Zalmi all the time. <laughs> Um, then I met him. I forgot his name, though, but he was an older guy. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else I know from Chicago. I don't know, Zalmi. Maybe Zalmi, but he, he hasn't been there in like 20 years. But oh, okay. still, maybe the same guys know him. Hey, do y'all know Ash Remeza? Mm, He's like sure. a TikTok rabbi, but it's an interesting rabbi, dude. He's got some interesting takes on Judaism. About what? On just Judaism as a whole. He has some interesting takes. Interesting. What's up? Uh, here, actually. You know um, Yisrael Shem Tov, right? The Red Devil? I probably know him by face, maybe. I mean, Shem Tov sounds familiar. I forgot, like, where another. Oh, okay. Uh, is that related to, like... Um, Baal Shem Tov? <laughs> no, isn't, isn't there, like, the Shem Tov who runs, like, 770 or something? Like, Avram Shem Tov or something? Is that related? It could be. It or, could be. Interesting. Like, the one on the board of a Gudas Chassidic Chabad or something? I think he's, like, Avram Shem Tov. I don't know. Wow. Someone's requesting as a guest, but we had like this debate about he's like a pro pally guy. So I bring let's him on. Him. Let's let's educate him a little yeah. bit. I don't know, educate is a strong word, you know. Yeah. Cool. 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 We have an echo. Yeah, very big echo. It's kind of deal breaker. All right, I guess it's a sign. It's a divine sign. I don't think we can educate, <laughs> dude. I tried. I tried earlier. Might be a lost cause. Um, whatever. Oh, he's gone. I don't know what happened. I didn't kick him. He must have left. So, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Oh, he's back. Okay, let's see. Um, yo, I actually is the echo fixed? Yeah, I have a question for Kosher. What's up? Wait, who? You know rabbis in Illinois? Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know any lawyers? I uh, my brother's a lawyer. I know many lawyers. Oh. Uh, Identify as a lawyer. Right. Do you need legal help, Goober? What troubles you? No, I'm just asking. I, I wanted to apply to UIC. Did you really? Yeah. Honestly, man, the way colleges are this day, just say that you support H Group, you'll get a full scholarship. That's all you have to do. <laughs> just, uh, no, uh, honestly, you don't need a lawyer to apply to UIC. Just apply. It's like a college. Yeah, no, you know? I know. I was going to study law. You should. They actually just... Uh, UIC is now affiliated with the law school in Chicago. Um, I forgot what it's called, but UIC now has its own law school that they just opened like two years ago. So, yeah, interesting. Being a lawyer would be an interesting profession. Just getting to debate all day, like analyze people's arguments, find holes in them, like give it's a like good. Like on TikTok anyway. <laughs> yeah, you can do it on TikTok too, to be honest. But you won't get paid for it unless you get a million views. Then you would. Yeah, what do you get? Like, like each thing is like five dollars, right? When someone gets a galaxy, it's like ten bucks or something, or like I don't even know. If you get like views on YouTube, YouTube. then you could get like a lot of money. Oh, they pay you for views on TikTok? 
No, I'm saying if you if you publish it afterwards and start like gaining a following, then eventually, you know, on YouTube, you can get billions, trillions. I have a question about your uh, Jewish people growing out their beards. Uh, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, besides for the creator commanding us not to cut them, there's a lot of Kabbalistic spiritual significance as well. A beard is associated with um, with mer with divine mercy. It says um, metaphorically, there's like 13 ways that the creator forgives people, and that those ways are metaphorically um, compared to the creator's beard, so to speak. Even though the creator doesn't have a body or anything, but um, the idea of a beard is like elicits divine mercy. Etc. Which is I've actually seen cool. that in some of the mysticism, where like Hashem's beard. I've seen that. Yeah, that's referring to like metaphorically, like the thirteen ways that the Creator forgives people for different reasons. It's compared to the beard. Um, meet us. What was the that? Midot, the midot. Midot attributes. Yeah. Right. I mean, I I do like programming. You know, I know what attributes are, but I don't think anyone else knows what attribute the word at. <laughs> Attributes mean. I mean, what is it? I don't think anyone uses the word attributes in a sentence. Like, do they? Not, it's not so common. It's not so common. People more say characteristics. Yeah. Characteristics, it's a good yeah. <laughs> Properties, maybe. And but, yeah. women have to like cover their hair, but they still wear wigs. If they're married, they could cover their hair or wear wigs. Wig is considered covering their hair because it's not their own hair, so this, it's fine. This is a this is a deep question. A lot of people ask, if the point is modesty, then why do Jewish women they wear a wig? Yeah, it technically covers their hair, but it looks like real hair. So I guess I heard the that. answer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead after you. Well, that the point is not, it, the reason for it isn't to reduce like the attractiveness of a, of a woman. That's not the point of the, the law. The point is that a woman's actual hair is something very private, very personal, that's only to be shared with her husband. And perhaps, I don't know if she's even allowed by her kids. Maybe she is. I don't know about that. But I think usually they wear like a, a techel by their kids, but it's only really for her husband to see her actual hair. Oh, wow. Kids cannot see. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. The, the rabbi can, can clarify if that's not, true. Not even a rabbi. <laughs> I know. My goal is to see how many times I can make you say that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, heard, I heard that like someone does not, is not attracted to someone if the hair is not their own. It's just like some kind of natural property, but it's not considered like attractive but naturally if it's not their own hair. Um, there's just something about it. And it's only referring to married women, by the way. But if someone's never been married before, then they don't have to cover it at all. Do no, no, no. so. we sing it again? What was that? Do boys and girls like uh, mix in your religion? Like, are they allowed to talk to each other before marriage? But they have to use sign language. They're not allowed to speak yeah. verbally. They have to signal with hands. <laughs> no, kidding. They could like talk here and there. They're not supposed to talk excessively, though. Um, like for business purposes or like other like maybe to be nice or something but yeah it's not supposed, they're not supposed to talk excessively definitely oh yeah that's really similar to islam uber are you muslim yeah what do you think is the most beautiful teaching of islam women are allowed to kill their rapist <laughs> That's the first thing you thought of? Oh, like a vault goober, you got me with that. I was not uh, expecting that. I, didn't, I thought they needed to have five male witnesses, no? Right. I'm not sure, but he is allowed to unalive them. Interesting. Wow. What Are you Palestinian? Yeah. Your parents are from Palestine? Or you were born there? No, my parents are American. So your grandparents were born in Palestine? No, we're we're Palestinian. My no, my grandparents were. from your grandparents, no. right? No, <laughs> we're all from Palestine. It's like just who, like we're, what generation are you guys in America? Is my question. It goes really back in I think eighteen hundreds. We have a little Palestine here in Chicago. I know I'm in <laughs> Chicago too. I wear a helmet whenever I walk through that town. Believe me, I understand. It's uh. You guys yeah, are both no, the same. It's quite a place. We came here at like in the 1800s, I think. 1800s. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's a long time ago. We've been wow. here for a while. Why did your family leave in the 1800s? I thought things were good. That was in before Palestine. the Nakba, right? That yeah, was before the Zionist entity. I don't know. I think like my great 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 had the first American citizenship. 
Oh my gosh. Yep. Hey, so this says that during the act, a woman's allowed to do that, but not after in an act of revenge. It goes to court, and if the criminal is proven guilty, he's punished. Interesting. Where are you reading from? I just Googled it, and then I got on Reddit. Mm -hmm. ChatGPT. Interesting. But I so, like, that. Uh, that makes, I'm pretty sure that any woman can, like, defend herself. Uh, but anyway. Wait, are you replying to what I said? Right. Like, it's not a thing. Like, so you, you, you were saying that, like, a woman can get revenge on the guy and kill them after they've been raped? Or what were you saying? Um, let me see. I don't know. To be honest, that's like, great. You didn't make no, it up. You know about that rabbi, the TikTok no, friendly language? Yeah, it's, we might get banned, so. Um, oh, yeah, work. you have to censor yourself. My bad. Yes. One day, maybe I'll make a replacement TikTok. Like, because for example, just as an example of TikTok friendly language. H group committed mass grape in our Schmerist organization. Uh, that's yes, how you say that. I think you have to say T, T organization. I looked it up. It says, yes, Islamic law considers it obligatory for a woman to defend herself against unlawful. Yeah, the self defense is. Wait, but Goober, what does, what does Islam and, oh, and it says, and she is not at fault if she unalives the attacker in the process. Does Islam have laws of war, Goober, or no? Yeah. There's like a. There is, yeah. Are you it's allowed to, to kidnap babies according to the laws of war? That's a good question. Oh, it, <laughs> is that what the host told you? No, I'm just asking if that's allowed or if it talks about kidnapping babies in war, if that's okay. By uh, no, like uh, the ma the mastermind behind October 7th. Like, there's no, I didn't say October 7th. I'm speaking hypothetically. I'm just, you know, in general, are you allowed to kidnap uh, babies in war? No, of course not. Okay, but since you mentioned it, they did do that on October seventh. Yeah, I knew you, I knew you were going to say that, but the mastermind behind October seventh uh, was really strict about that. From he was trying to like really prevent his militants from doing so. He was stressing. He was stressing his orders too much, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And they didn't give him back after three hundred days. So yeah, I guess yeah. That's it. These are the eleven months that never gave him back. Gave him back. The commands in war in Islam is do not cut a tree, do not kill a child. Don't okay. cut a tree, but you can burn kids alive in front of their families. Got it. Interesting. Um, I I don't think you've seen the video where a, an Israeli tank literally shot a kibbutz home. That doesn't lead to a person being tied up and burnt to a crisp, though, unless the tank tied the person up. Wait, so real quick, in Islamic law, you need, I knew about the adultery between four witnesses. But in for the R word, you you have to have four witnesses too. And then they have to be in person, male witnesses, right? Yeah, that doesn't that's impossible. That makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Goober. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out in terms of Islamic law because the, the Taliban in Afghanistan just passed a law based on Islam that women aren't allowed to speak in public. They're only allowed <laughs> to speak in the home. Is that also part of the Quran? I'm I'm just doing a research project. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not. I'm not really religious. No, no, it makes sense. We have hey, another guy joining. The Jeremiah me. Pasuk that the guy in the comments is talking about. Interesting. We have, hi, welcome, welcome back. Speaking. This, this other guy, Seth, wants to join as well. I'm not sure. I never had him before. For them. Hey, um, I'm the city, okay. Everyone meet Speakeasy if you haven't met him before. He's been on What's here a few speakeasy? times. Wait, Kusher J, Kusher J, I didn't know uh, H-Group can burn um, people alive with AK-47s. No, they used uh, fire and gasoline to do that. Hey, yo, Kusher yeah. J, why are you talking against. about Islamic yes. law when you yourself are not willing to speak on halakha or Jewish law? You understand that most of the things most of the are Seth, also found in the YouTube. Talmud and halakha? So, Seth, I don't, I don't think we've ever met before. You have, no, you. You, you have no knowledge if I'm willing to speak about halakha or the Talmud, so I don't know where you got that from. We'll talk on it. Well, you're, you're saying things that are literally also stated. Like, adultery is also punishable by stoning. Homosexuality is also punishable no by one, stoning. No one, brought up adultery things, no, no one brought up either of those yeah, two we didn't topics. Mention that. What are you talking about? Yeah. You, talked about you talked about the separation of women in society. Like, yeah, Orthodox just, Jewish synagogues are still separated down. by gender. And plus, you guys no, have all sorts of messed up beliefs in your book. What do you mean, you guys, Seth? You're a yid. What are you in denial? Your last name is. I'm Rosenbaum. not Jewish. No, this, this is a fake us? name. No, I'm not Jewish. No. Why do you put a fake Jewish name. name on TikTok? That's not normal. You're <laughs> not normal. Yeah, what is guys, wrong with you? Calm down. 
Calm down. It's funny. Seth, what are you? I'm Christian. I'm an, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Mm. Uh, you're afraid afraid Lord Lord and Savior Lord. Jesus Lord. Christ. Who, by the way, I know what your book says about him. It's not very friendly. What book? Don't they also like burn witches in Catholicism and stuff? Yeah, they should burn witches, yeah. So it's the same thing. Look, Seth, I get why you're upset, because you honestly, you have a fake religion. Are you, are you Chabad Lubavitch or something there, Osmos? This is, is the that only you are? book I use. I don't know what book you're talking about. It Wait, doesn't matter. The, the Babylonian Talmud. question. Are, are we Lubavitch? Don't believe in the Talmud. Are we Lubavitch? Yeah, are, you, are you Chabad Lubavitch? Uh, What's a Lubavitch? <laughs> Lubavitch, you schmata. It's called Lubavitch. Are you Chabad? Is that, are you Hasidic? What, what's your deal? Pronounce it like a mensch. Chabad. Chabad. Say it properly. Did you know that your like lead rebbies have like horrific uh, accusations of child abuse on them? Like your leaders, who you guys consider like really important. If have, that's like, true, if that if that if that's horrific true, horrific rates must... of child molestation. Wait, Seth, if if that's true, you must know his name. Which one are you talking about? I, why would I know that off the top of my head? Bro, 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 bro. Don't bring up stuff you don't bro, know bro, about. Bro, bro, bro. You hey, you're a name. Jew. You can't Mata. make fun of people, bro. You're a Jew. Your blood is weak. Anyways, bro. You're literally Chabad. You guys have like human trafficking tunnels, bro. You know like, what? You just, I was going to allow you. I was really going to allow you to be my Shabbos goy this Shabbos, but you lost the opportunity. Yeah, I'm not going to be your Shabbos goy. You're not going to be my Shabbos goy this week, Seth. I'm not going to be a Shabbos goy. I'm not going to be a Shabbos goy Kai. Christ is Lord. And also wow. the Holocaust is entirely justified. Mm. Hey, Kosher J, real quick. You know what the difference is between Jesus and a almost. I don't know if you're new, but this is generally where you drop someone when they say the. Why well, are you sound like a homosexual? You realize that I that's a crime modern. in Judaism, right? You sound it like a homosexual. It only takes one nail to hang the picture of I Jesus. Like three, you yeah, Kosher, Kosher J, you sound good. like a homosexual. That's against the halakha. You know that, right? I'm proud and you to sound like a whiny no, little it's, it's, woman. It says in Deuteronomy that you can't take it up the butt, bro. So why are you doing that? I have a beautiful woman as a wife. What do you mean? Is that, uh, are you sure about that? Because you sound a little limp in the wrist, bud. You sound a little... Um, I'm just saying, bro. I mean, you, you sound are like... you married? You sound Yo. like the Chabad without the... Yo. Without Yo. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. If you want to actually have a serious debate, if you want to have a serious debate, you're more than welcome. But if you're just going to be a little troll... Then you can just buzz off. Look, hang on. Let me say this. I did say that Seth can't be my Shabbos goy this Shabbos, but next week he could. If you if you keep up the bad behavior, though, Sethy, it's going to be a month before you can turn my stove on Shabbos. Okay? So be a good little boy, Sethy boy. Can you okay? explain why the age don't cost? Make, if, you don't, if you keep it up, you're going to stay home from Sunday school this week, Sethy you know, boy. Explain why it wasn't justified. Got it, Sethy boy. Be a good little boy, Sethy. Explain why the age cost wasn't justified. That's a lot. Hey, bud, explain why the age cost wasn't justified. Explain why it wasn't justified. Steffi, you didn't Wait, get he, any. Is he asking how age group is justified? Hey guys, hey guys, let's welcome a new guest. Um, God knows, uh, we've known each other for a little bit on different lives. Nice oh, to no, meet you. Okay. Nice to see oh, you. No, man. Good, to you. Good to see you. What, what did he? Was he pro pally? I don't know, man. He wasn't pro pally. He was pro age cost. He was literally a schmazzy. His name. His name is a uh, ortho groip. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's groiper. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was about, but um, it's all good. He could come back later if he wants one day, maybe. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm a, like those people. They don't even deserve engagement. You're oh, Christian, and you support Israel. Yeah, a hundred percent. Look how the guy on top of me is grinning. <laughs> no, he's just laughing at the other thing. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's like, you. <laughs> I'm laughing at you. <laughs> what do you mean? What's the problem? Okay. Dude, you're laughing. Sethy the Shabbos Goy. Seth yeah. Allah's a very so good funny? boy. Sethy is a Shabbos Goy. Sethy, like, you're going to taste the chullin for us just to see if it's good, but you don't get a full plate. You just get to taste it. You got that little Shabbos Goy? You be a good okay, little boy, okay. Sethy. Okay, guys. Okay. It's a little much now. Anyway, maybe we can switch topics again. You shlamil um, shmata. Okay, okay. <laughs> we got it. We got it. Anyway, um, yeah, what's up? Do you, do you want to say anything, God knows? Or just in general? No, just I, was, I was just seeing what's going on. Nice, nice. Um, well, cool, cool. Barry well, I have a question <laughs> for God knows. What? Um, all right, let's, depends on the question. I may or may not answer it. Let's see. Well, what are your thoughts on the uh, humanitarian American workers that were air stricken by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza? Wrong. When did that happen? 
you know the 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 humanitarian convoy that was in Gaza. You know Nick? Do you know Nick Mattel? No. I was just on his live a minute ago. Yeah, go to his live, Goober. Wait, no, Goober, I'm, I'm are, asking, you, are, you, are you talking you. about the UN car that was hit by Israel? Is that what you're referring to? It's not a UN car, I don't think. It was a humanitarian convoy. You need to be spell? more. You have to be more specific. If you have a question, bring up a specific that are in Gaza, dude. You need to blame H group. For uh, I thought he knew what it was possible. because it was wide. I thought everyone knew about it. Okay, when did it happen? Uh, Recently. When was this? Okay. You don't know when it was. You don't know where it was. Gaza aid convoy, April two, twenty twenty four. What happened? Guys, okay, okay. that's the wait a second. Let me the look. The seven at. world central kitchen workers died. Whoa, on that one. Okay, after. I'll tell you what happened. So, first of all, we have many videos of H group with AK 47s going up to UN marked trucks, going up to A trucks, and stealing the food. There's a tons of videos like this. In terms of this truck, that was it. It was nighttime. They didn't see the markings that were on the car. It was an accidental strike, and Israel immediately took responsibility and apologized for the accidental strike. It's a horrible mistake. It's war, and those things happen. That's Max. almost that's almost a good explanation. But the picture I'm looking at right now, um, this is not a truck that holds food. This is a, a it's a World truck. Central Kitchen truck. It is a it's an aid truck. They hit it by mistake. I understand. This, this is something you. Tr you use as transportation, not food. What's your I point? I understand what trucks are for. It's a world central kitchen truck that was hit by mistake. This is old news. What are you talking about? Um, well, I'm just saying there were Americans on board and IDF on a live time. Right. You understand yeah, what a mistake is? They were taken hostage by H Group, so you should blame H Group for taking Americans hostage. And they were also um, on a live a few days ago. Six hostages were look, brutally unalived in cold blood. Yeah, that's one of the bad. Bad. He, doesn't, he doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Uh, what about Rachel? When it comes Porter? to accidents, they like follow. They focus on the accidents the most. When it comes to what about Rachel? What about Rachel? You, 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 you care about you care a lot Uber. about the Palestinian Uber. people. If you're, if you're not a what coward. about what about if Rachel? you cared about the Palestinian people, then you would condemn H Group for committing about, a massacre and then hiding behind the children of Gaza. But you don't talking like what, a rabbi. What about Rachel Corey before October seventh? Okay, so basically, if I remember correctly, but she, she was wearing any, she was a where she was wearing she a wasn't very anywhere, uh, she wasn't anywhere near a Palestinian village. She was out in the fields, protesting the bulldozing because the bulldozers were used to crush tunnels that were at the Philadelphia route. Oh no! No, 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 no! Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on! You, you can't asked crush about tunnels this. with the bulldozers. I'm answering. I'm answering this question. I didn't okay? even answer it. I am answering I this question, Goober. Okay, and she stands in front of a giant bulldozer with a nine feet tall blade where the window has a small FOV. And even though she has a reflective vest, she was in the way and refused to get out of the way and got ran over. It tends to happen when you stand in front of a vehicle. Yeah, and Wait. adding on to that, the bulldozer, if you look at a picture of it inside or like a depiction, it, there's very little vis visibility, so. Which is what I said, FOV, very little FOV. Yeah. Wait, Goober, no, you, you keep bringing up people's name. What about Fear Bebas? Do you know that name? That's a good question. Goober, do you know yeah, Fear Bebas? So, uh, yeah, there was Who is actually. That? Who's uh, Fear Bebas? Before October 7th, there was actually a two-year-old boy that was shot in the face. No, no, try to focus on my question. Who's Kafir Bibas? It was a yeah. child that was taken hostage, but at the same right. time, so the at the same baby, time, at the so same the time. Eight, the eight-month baby, there was, eight there was so took, along with his three-year-old hey, brother, don't mute me. and his mother, after age group unalived their entire family. So oh, no geez. one is going to give their tears for your little T organization that commits massacres. They're subhuman animals. We're going to go into the tunnels where these creatures hide. We're going to pull them into the light of day. And we're going to clean up Gaza so that it's a nice, clean, beautiful place. We're going to open up Chabad's there. And we won't have these problems anymore. Goober, go um, on next live. Said, uh, what? I said go on next live. You know Nick? Uh, I spoke to him before. Um, but... Go again. Uh, you're, you're Palestinian, you said, right? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you, when did the land first get called Palestine? I mean, as a Palestinian, you must uh, I really don't want to go through the Roman BS 
Oh no, uh, it goes way before the Roman. Oh, how is that bullshit? Because it's just all propaganda. Uh, no, I know propaganda. Goober, you need to open a book. You need to learn. You need to put facts into your brain. This is important for a growing guy to fill his brain with facts. Read the Bible, Ooh. Goober. The Palestine in the Bible is, isn't the Palestine of today. You know that? Different people. Yeah, fun fact. Different, different location also. Goober, have you ever read an entire book from start to end? Do you, do you see the do you see my profile picture? This is an ice cream shop. Yeah, I know. It's a picture of the Sudanese flag. What do you love about Sudan so much? What's your name? What's your name? New guest. Goober's a big fan of the Sudan. Yo, Besa. Um, want to introduce yourself? Now this is a long flag in his profile picture. No, this is actually an ice cream shop with. This is since 1941 with the Palestine flag under it. Uh, this was a nice shop. I'll the tell you what, Goober, the Palestine flag, as you have it, didn't come into existence until 1964, yeah. so try it. Yeah. So the ice cream <laughs> shop is... From the, the, Jordan, the Jordan flag, they took out the star early. Exactly. Anyways, Imagine so the meeting they had to make the Palestine flag. They were like, all right, this is the Jordanian flag. It's nice, but we can't just... I said, okay, let's, this let's is take the, out the star. This is, no. an ice, this is an ice cream shop older than the state of Israel. Um, if you look at it, Israel is a state. Unless that ice cream shop is 3,000 years old, that's when the nation of Israel started. So try again. Even open before, up, the, open up your little language. Quran. How often does it say Palestine yeah. in there? You have nothing. Let's go with the new guest. Let's, let's, let's greet our new guest. What's your name, new guest? In the bottom corner. Poster is being really hostile. It's based. What's up? Yeah, you're getting exposed. Nothing much. What's up? What's, what's, the, to what's the topic of the discussion at hand? Well, Palestine originally we were talking songs. about, well, now we're talking about Palestine, but originally we were talking about um, the month of Elul, the first day of Elul, which is tonight, the last day, last month of the year in the Jewish calendar. And this is the first day of that month, which is um, the first day of this third set of 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was on the mountain. Moses was on the, was on the mountain for a long time. And during the last set, of 40 days and 40 nights, when the Jewish, when the, when the Creator forgave the Jewish people for worshiping the golden calf, then the, the last set of 40 days and 40 nights was a time of divine mercy that the Creator gave the second set of tablets. And everything that happened to the Torah, it happened again every year. So the, the entire month of Elul is a time of divine mercy. This time, originally, that's the time the Creator told Moses 13 ways that he forgives all people for everything. And that those ideas of forgiveness um, and mercy they shine openly every t every every year during the month of Elul, and right in the beginning of Elul, that's where we are, where we are now. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, real quick question for you, based. I know it's there's okay. the Gregorian calendar, and that's usually Western Christians and the Catholics that they go by. I know Orthodox, the Church has a different calendar as well. No, it, we oh, we no. use the revised Julian calendar calendar so it's basically uh what's it called it's basically the gregorian calendar except the months like uh easter is on a different date that's it that's wait much. god knows are you orthodox yeah yeah what what patriarch do you belong under uh the oca oh you're part of oca very nice yeah i'm rocor right now I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Yeah, I don't know what that is, either, but it sounds good. <laughs> I'm Jamaican Protestant. I'm Jewish. Nice to meet you. Wait, kosher? I'm, you're you're Protestant? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm a I'm a yid. I'm Jewish. Yeah. Me and him. I'm Jewish, just like Goober. I knew Goober back in Hebrew school. Now he changed his tune, but he was a very good student. Actually, he learned all space very quickly, and now he's uh, going a little bit off the derech. But he yeah, used actually, to be a joke, or did you actually you know? Both live in Chicago, right? Yeah, Goober. He was one of, he was like a Rosh Hashiva, and now he went pro Palestine. He's he changed. He used to be really with us. Hey, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Wait, hold up. I have a question for God knows. Who's your, who's your bishop? Uh, Benjamin. Bishop, bishop Benjamin. Man. Let's go. Well, yeah, um, okay. What specific uh, diocese? What do you mean diocese? I mean met uh, metropolis. Sorry. Uh, I don't know. Metropolis. That's a big word. Like you have like um the Bishop of Dallas, you have like the Bishop like what what metropolis do you fall under specifically? 
I don't know. Give me. Let me look it up. All right, bud. You guys want to sing it again? It's actually kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, because you guys, I already know what you guys know. Besides from me and Kosher. <laughs> we can teach What's them. An them. Is there an L O Niggin or no? I only know that two Niggernum, to be honest. Yeah, I actually have a different calendar than both the host and kosher. We, I go by the biblical calendar. I don't know, it doesn't say. <clears throat> what do you mean by well, the biblical calendar? Like the first month, second month? Yeah, first month, second month, but we follow the Abib. The what? The Abib. Oh, so you know, where, where, the where they inspect the barley, and when the barley is ripened, then new moon of... The following month is the start of the so new year. Have, you guys have leap months? You have a 13th month or no? It really is dependent. So it, do, it's, do you follow the, the calendar in the Talmud or no? No, we don't follow the ca calendar in the Talmud. Interesting. Goober. Hold Goober, on. you in knows. Chicago? God knows. Are you still there? Yeah, I am from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's down? Is it, ben is it Bishop Benjamin Peterson? Yeah, I, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, you're under the metropolis of San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, you give out. Oh, <laughs> Gotten Himmel, Goober. So, where do you live in? Like Rogers Park or like which suburb? Skokie. Skokie? Oh my gosh, we're momish neighbors. I knew I remembered you. We live in the same town. <laughs> so, nice. Is it true, utmost, that. Uh, the calendar that Rabbinites use was developed by Hillel the Elder. Um, I think so. I mean, it was based on. I think I think it is, as far as I know. I mean, the set the set calendar that we have now. Before that, it was based on the Sanhedrin. Um, but yeah, pretty sure once the Sanhedrin was disbanded, then I think there was. I think it was Hillel. Pretty sure it was, who's made the set calendar. Yeah. Okay. Um, before that, it was Sanhedrin, no, but yeah. Because like my family, would, like we would call up cousins in Eretz Israel, and they'd be like, "Okay, we're going to inspect the barley this month and see if it's ripened, and we'll tell well, you." They still if, inspect uh, the bar. They still do the. They still do that nowadays. You think? Yeah, we do. Interesting. The Ian, you said land back, please, in the comments. What do you mean? We already sure. took our land back. So we're sure. Yeah, come come up as a guest, Ian. What do you mean? What land? Coaster, I have a question. Go ahead, neighbor. What's on your mind? If um, if Israel is three thousand years old, then why did the creators of Israel, like uh, the creators of the Zionist project, they wanted to actually colonize Uganda? You know the Uganda scheme. I know. I know what you're talking about. So I'm glad you brought that up. Israel is three thousand years old. This is according not only to uh, every religion, but all historians agree that this is true. Uh, when it comes to the Uganda plan. This was in the early 20th century when Jews were being massacred in Ukraine and Russia and other parts of Europe in a lot of pogroms. So there was a desperate, urgent need to get Jews out of Europe into a place of their own. And they offered Uganda. And you know what the Zionist Congress said? They said, even though we're being unalived by the tens of thousands and this will save our physical lives, we don't want to be anywhere else besides our ancestral homeland our promised land so they turned it down they would rather be massacred than live in a place that isn't their place they only have their eyes set on eretz yisrael the holy lands wow interesting who said that it was discussed in the zionist congress i believe of 1904 but herzl proposed he put it to a vote if they should go somewhere else and they voted not to do it wait who offered you guys uganda Nobody it, offered Uganda. It was it a was proposal. A it wasn't offered. Yeah, it was a simple proposal. By who? It was one of Herzl's proposals, and I think it was in tandem when he was talking to the lead of the British delegation. But at the end of the day, the entire Zionist Congress voted against the Uganda scheme. Goober, here's my question. Do you remember the Palestine scheme when you guys were offered to have a state in 1947? Why did you guys say no to that? You could have had a state by now. 
So when you take someone's million dollars and you offer them half, I don't think they want half. I think they if someone stole a million dollars from me and then offered to give me back five hundred thousand, first of all, I would definitely take it. What? Second of all, we didn't take anything from you in the first place. You would not take it. Of course. Why would I? I would rather have half a million than zero. Are you crazy? Well, you would fight for all of it. But I would take first half, and then I would continue fighting. Take the half. That's what. That's what they did on October seven. Oh, okay. I didn't know when that. Did, when did the Jews steal the land from the Palestines? When did they do that? They mo most what, what? the H group leaders were were originally from um, Ashkelon, spe specifically. Ashkelon, dude, yeah. my wife's from that town. What are you talking about? That's not an Arab town. Cooper, let's it back up a second. What are, what, are, what are the Palestinians? What what type of people are they? What's can you their can you do me a favor and look up Al Jura? It's a That's Arab okay. I don't need to look up your Arab League, Michigas. Who are the Palestinian people? Are they Listen, are they Arab? Al Jura was a wait, Goober, Goober. Are the Palestinians Arab? Hold on, Hold on. I want to tell you something. Al Jura, Al Jura, Al -Jura, gonna, Al -Jura gonna, was gonna, a gonna, Palestinian gonna, village, but they I'm gonna look Ashtelon. up your your Candace Owens uh, stuff in a second, but. Is are Palestinians Arab? That's my question. Is who Arab? Bro, you're Palestinian, right? There are these people called Palestinians. Are they Arab people? Yeah. Yeah, we're, they are. Okay. So where do Arabs come from? Um, from Israeli propaganda, they originate in the Arabian Peninsula. But that's, so you think that's it's propaganda sense. that Arabs come from Arabia? I don't know. It kind of makes sense that they probably do. No, I said the Arabian Peninsula. This is right. something from you know so, who Sahar to. But let's TV back up. Is. So you admitted that Palestinians are Arabs, and then you accept that Arabs come from the Arabian Peninsula. Therefore, no, that's I was regurgitating Israeli, Israeli propaganda. Dude, how, where else do you think Arabs come from? China? Uh, when I took my DNA test, I was from the Levant. Oh wow. Blood quantum isn't inherently an indicator of ethnogenesis, though. I don't care. Well, I do. This is why Israel sterilizes Ethiopian women so they stop reproducing. That's backwards. actually that's false. Sure. That's, that's actually been that's first of all, uh, Israel rescued the Ethiopian talk. people that were being unalived and persecuted. That's, that's, so that's an illusion. That's an illusion. They also the same this they yeah. also they also regurgitate the same propaganda that there are two million Arabs in Israel that leave that live uh, with rights, but that's not true. Okay, it's, Goober, name me one right that an Arab Israeli citizen doesn't have. That the, the literal has. the Arabs in the Knesset literally uh, go against uh, racist and apartheid uh, apartheid okay, laws. Okay, Goober, I need you to focus on the specific question that I'm asking. You made a claim that Arab Israeli citizens don't have the same rights as Jewish Israeli citizens. So name me one right that a Jewish Israeli has that an Arab Israeli does not have. Go. The right to live in their home. Uh, there's a video that circulated a couple years ago where this uh, this um, woman that had Israeli citizenship, she, she got her citizenship revoked and then she became um, homeless after this random guy from New Jersey took her home. That's His complete. Was... That's complete nonsense. First of all, there's. Do you no want to watch law. the video? Do you want yeah, to watch send the it video? to me. But let me tell you something. There's no law in Israel that a Palestinian and Arab Israeli citizen doesn't have the right to a home. You know what you have to do to have a home? You have to pay the mortgage. You have to pay the rent. If she didn't pay, then no, she doesn't get to stay in the house. That's how it is anywhere. I would also like you to interject. You are stealing my house. You are stealing my house. I know the guy Jacob. I know this guy. No, no one, no one is allowed to steal it, Yami. Legally, that's actually his property, and he had every right Goober, to we've all seen the video. Hang on, hang on. Thing. Goober just proved that there's an apartheid in Israel based on a video of an Arab lady yelling at a Jewish guy. Hey, you Goober, show the YouTube did you channel. Not, did you not hear what he said? Quote, unquote. Goober, quote, unquote. Exactly. Quote, you unquote. You know why that quote, happened, unquote. Goober? Quote, Hold on. If, quote, if, you don't, if I don't steal it, someone else will steal it. I know what he said. You know why he said that? Because the woman didn't pay her rent or her mortgage. She was already evicted from the house. She was already legally not the owner of the house anymore. So Where? the guy was saying, this isn't your house anymore. If I don't move in, someone else is going to move in. This was after she was already evicted. It wasn't what? like he caused that. Well, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Where, where'd you get all that from? I looked into the story. I know exactly what where, story. Where can I find that? Where can about. I find that? 
I have a genuine question. Give me evidence. I want to look that up. I'll send it to you, Goober. Don't worry. You're going to learn a lot. We'll meet for a bagel. Go ahead. I have a genuine question. And yeah. It's about Israeli policy. Why does Israel decide to do airstrikes in Syria, which honestly weakens Assad, which is a buffer against Daesh? Israel does airstrikes in Syria because they're terrorists there that we need to take out. It's very simple. But you're striking areas that Russia considers to be of great interest to them. Do we care about Russia? We have to take care of our I own think security. You should care about what Russia does because they're very easily angered. And what well, are they going to do to us? The I mean, do you do you understand the capability of Xander hypersonics? Yes, um, yes, I actually Israel's do. military is ten times more technologically advanced than Russia. <laughs> Look at what's going on in Ukraine. <laughs> the, they the can't feed a bunch of one hundred bishops. Literally, um, uh, the Russian bishops literally blessed uh, uh, soldiers or something for killing Ukrainians. Uh, uh, do you have any evidence of this? You didn't see that. No, uh, you're right. It, you're right. Russia is a very humane, good army. They never do anything wrong. Wrong. They're very. I mean, I, I mean, if, 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 I we wanna, if we want to start, hold up, hold up, hold up. If we're going to make the arguments, and I'm not arguing that any army is a moral army per se, because there's always going to be bad actors. What's up? Israel is the most moral army <laughs> in the world. Okay, yeah, that's funny. As they snipe Christians in a church, that's yeah, really moral. Well, I think you forgot that in the entire Middle East, Christians in Israel have the best life of any Christian. Yeah, yeah as, as you literally cause problems in Lebanon, where you sent in Druze to attack the LF. Yeah, no, that's I'll tell really you, funny. Lebanon used to be a beautiful, right. developed yeah. country yeah. under the Christians. Yeah, and, then, and, then the Muslims yeah. came Israel in. Israel actually yes. was allied with the LF, though. No, they sent in the Druze to betray Bashir. No, no, the PLO the went PLO. into Lebanon and destroyed no, the country. No, that's what happens. It's that not happens. just the PLO. The PLO was a problem. Yes, Sabra and Shatila. I'm well aware of what happened and all these different events. But that was orchestrated that, by Maronite Christians, though. Yes. Look, how do you yes. say your name? Baca? It's Baca? Based. Based. Based? Yes, Let me tell you uh, something. Based. Israel is a small but powerful country. In 1967, they were invaded by five Arab countries, and Israel destroyed all of those armies, and it took them less than a week. So when Israel attacks Syria, when Israel attacks Iran in defense, you know what they're doing? They're sending a message to these failed states, these non-countries that we can hit you wherever we want, whenever we want, and there's nothing you can do about it. Israel is letting them know, we're the big dog, and you're the little dog, and you better learn who the freaking superpower is. And okay, Russia's not going to so do a thing about it. The, you think that they're not going to do anything about it. That's where you're incorrect. Well, but. Russia gave Egypt all of their MiG fighter jets in the 1967 and 1973 war. And, and Egypt MiGs, lost about 100 planes to bro. every one Israeli plane. MiGs, so we're not afraid of, day, of uh, are, Russia's Cold War era weapons. I mean, Cold era weapons, no, they're not using those. They're using Sukhois, bro. Then how come Ukraine was able to just capture a ton of land in Russia? How come they can't beat Ukraine after two two and a half years a much smaller a country of and land they, you're they, calling they, they, the the kursk incursion a bunch of land that's literally like farmland. They took hundreds of square miles Putin's okay humiliated. and you know how long it takes to take that back i'm just saying russia is very weak they can't beat ukraine what are you talking about they're slowly chipping away in donbass oh yeah it's been two and a half years they've accomplished nothing i mean you could say that the ukrainians have had a bunch of time and they've done nothing they've sent in western tanks so they've basically gotten obliterated Hey, can we no. just hold on the whole Ukraine Russia conflict right now and no. return to what the host would want to talk about because this is his life? Karocha. Spitziva. Um, the host is a banany on a bad day. Do you guys have any questions about El or no? So in Elul, we learn that the king is in the field. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Look at Torah. No. So guys, we have an idea of the king being in the field and then the king being in the palace. What does it mean? It means by the month of Elul that God basically reaches out. He makes the first move to the Jewish people and he says, I'm in the field. I'm available. Come in and see me and meet with me. And you don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to put on your nicest clothes. Just come straight to see me. He lowers himself so that we can connect with him. Next month, in the month of Tishrei, where we have Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, the high holidays, the king is in the palace. 
and we have to make the first move. We have to ask him if we can connect and we have to put on our nicest clothes because when the king comes to you, you can wear whatever. When you go into the palace, you have to wear your nicest clothes. So this is a, a sicha and the rabbi can explain further. Not even a rabbi, but he keeps on saying that I am. Shkoyach. <laughs> um, we could explain it further, but does anyone um, have any questions? Or no? I'm not really interested. So, is anyone interested in this, first of all? Or no? Is it? Well, I mean, just going back to the whole question of the calendar and Hillel, I'm just curious. Is it true that Hillel tried to angle the calendar so that Yom Kippur does not land on a Friday? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Why would you? to fast before Shabbat. Ah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, usually in the standard way of looking at it in the Jewish law, it says that usually Elo is a time of fear and terror. It says that we blow the shofar, it's like a ram's horn, in order to, so to speak, scare people to return to the Creator, like to wake them up. But the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, explains Elo as a time of divine mercy, where the king is going out into the field to greet each and every one with a smiling face. So it seems to be different. But really, it's the same as it's explained. Ah, uh, the Panim. I remember that from the Sikha. Which Sikha did you read? Panim. I don't remember which one, but I learned the king in the field. I learned a lot of Sikhas about this every year, but I have to... Would you learn it? With someone or just on your own? No, I learned it with uh, Rabbi Shemho, Shemtov, Mandy Wolf. I learned it with some very esteemed uh, Hasidim. Esteemed. Nice. No, this is an auspicious time, and we need to have alacrity. <laughs> yeah, these words, like auspicious, I don't think they appear anywhere except for um, like Jewish translations of the Torah and stuff. But yeah. Um, basically, then, I mean, I think we're losing viewers, but whatever, it's all good. We could talk about this. We could talk about this, theoretically. But um, I mainly just want to talk about I mean, I want to talk about something that's good and something that people also want to talk about. It's better um, to connect one person with the light of Torah than to speak to a thousand about Mishigas. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll talk to you then. And people could listen. So um, there's a sicha, um, I can, there's a website I'm reading from that me and my friend made but that has like various talks on it in English also, but it's called dach.dev, D-A-C-H dot D-E-V. And this is a sikha from um, the year 5732 in Elul, um, Parsha Shoftim, which is this week's Parsha. And this is where it talks about, um, they said dach, the main I, question. I spell the second part, dach what? D-A-C-H dot D-E-V dot dev. Oh, okay. I'll show you how to get to, um, I wish I could, let me just try to screen share. The screen sharing on phones and TikTok. Oh, is I found of, it, um, I found it, I'm there. <laughs> Cool, cool. Yeah, so now I'm just going to try to show you how to get there to the one I'm at. Let me try to um, show, I have to turn off the screen screen for a second. And so this, okay, um, um, let me just, okay, so if you go to library, let me try to turn off here. So here's the website, doc.dev, can't really see, then go to library. Okay. And then, um, let's go to library, go to, go to, um, say from Amar and Maluka, which is the Rebbe's talks that he edited, uh -huh. and then go to months. And then Elul. Oh my gosh. This is a new website. I've never seen this before. Yeah, me and a friend just made it a couple months ago. Are you and serious? Then, um, yeah. Go yeah. And then um, it's kind of hard because the thing is that the, the index is in Hebrew. So um, that's, people who know Hebrew can. So it's kind of. The singles have in English, but it's this part that says Tafshin Lamed Bays, 57 um, 32, 1972, page um, 260. Three in volume one. The word so right that here. ends with uh, Lamed Gimel as the last Lamed Bays. Lamed, Lamed Bays, right here. Tasha Lamed Bays. Okay. The page, Reish Samech Gimel, 263. Oh my gosh. And then at the top, it's, it's actually it's volume three, page 263. So if you, you could type it in the links, we have to figure, we have to figure out the, the URLs to fix them. But, but it's, it's only it's, in Hebrew, right? Or Yiddish? No, no. So you could do English also. If you click the A, it has uh -huh. an English. Oh wait, oh shoot, this one doesn't have an English translation. <laughs> we, right. we added English, but some of them, some, sometimes I guess it was broken for some of them. 
Um, for whatever reason, this one does not have it in English. But because of AI nowadays, what you could do is you could copy it and just – because we, we the, our translation is just based on um, AI. So oh, wow. literally you could just tape, paste it into chat GBT. I'll try uh, it. Let me try that. If you don't know Hebrew um, or if you're learning uh, Hebrew. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, paste it, just paste it and then don't even say anything. It should just translate it automatically. I'm going to oh, no. paste the first one. <laughs> oh, now, it's, now it's talking to me in Hebrew. <laughs> okay, that's a problem. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> so no, I'm going to say, okay, it's explaining like, it's, now it's explaining it in Hebrew because now it's thinking that I only speak Hebrew. No, I'm going to say translate. Just say translate that. And I got I'm, it. Yeah, yeah. But then you can feel free to read it when you want. We can talk about it. It's like this. I just did the first part, and then we can. Uh, yeah, the first part. Yeah, this is a paragraph by paragraph. At the in time. the name of God, Wednesday, Parsha Shaif team, the night of Rish Chodesh Elul, fifty-seven thirty-two, nineteen seventy-two. Yes. Oh, this, by the way, I think this is when I got married. I think this is what I, the mimer I said. I you am my. Oh yeah. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Oh, wait, Shira, Shira. you got married in Elul. Were you married uh, in Elul? I. Got married by. <laughs> oh, Eve! How am I forgetting the parsha? <laughs> Do you know um, your anniversary? <laughs> lech lecha, parshas lech lecha. My wife just reminded me. But oh, nice. uh, okay, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. The acronym for Elul is "I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine." And it is explained in the Kuti Torah in the discourse that Elul, in Elul, there is an awakening from below. Ataru ta de la tata. I think that's not the right translation. Atarusa de la sata, an awakening from below. Yeah. Uh -huh. I am my beloved. While on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there is an awakening from above. Ataru ta de lila. Ataruta or Isarusa, an awakening from uh -huh. above. My beloved is mine. So just so you guys understand, this month it goes from below to above. No, I'm sorry. This month, God comes from up there to down here, and next month, it that's goes from thing. down here to up there. That's the thing. And this month, I mean, at first it says that this month we go from down here to up there. Oh. And then it says doing Rosh Hashanah. Uh, that's part of the question. First, we say that the entire verse of, of Song of Songs, I, my beloved, and my beloved is mine, both of these parts are the acronym of Elul, both of them. But then it says right after, seemingly a contradiction, that in Elul, it's I am my beloved's, but in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we have my beloved as mine. So this is like setting up, it's kind of like a contradiction. Got it, okay. This needs to be understood. At the beginning of the discourse, it says that Elul is an acronym. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. But immediately afterward, it explains that in Elul, it is only I am my beloved's. While my beloved is mine refers to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah, so this is quoting a discourse from the Alter Rebbe, and we're asking questions on it. I mean, it's at first we're explaining the discourse of the Alter Rebbe. So this is all in the Alter Rebbe's discourse. It's just explaining that the first part of the discourse is really like asking a question on itself, even though we wouldn't really understand that on our own. But it's right. just like, yeah, if that makes sense. So this uh, is nothing new here. We're just explaining the discourse of the Alter Rebbe. And when we do that, we're explaining how like the discourse itself implies a question, if that makes sense, if the question makes sense. 100%. Yeah, so now, since our translation didn't work, you could just copy the next part and paste I have it into the, I have the next paragraph up. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, whenever you're ready. The anyway, I'm going to be dropping, guys, but I'll catch y'all later. All right, oh, yeah, oh. I thought we would, I knew we would bore someone, but it's worth it. All right. All right, let's see you. It's like that. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's all good. It's all good. Um, I can read. Let me read one more paragraph. The discourse right. continues that Elul is a time for the revelation of the 13 attributes of mercy, as you said about. It explains that this revelation in Elul is for everyone, even the most distant. It yeah, is so like... That, yeah, was, well, so that's like explaining why in Elul we also have the idea of my beloved is mine, even though we just said that really it's during Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, but because we have the attributes of mercy... And Elul, that's also like the beloved is mine. That's like something from above as well. Exactly. Um, it explains that this revelation in Elul is for everyone, even the most distant. It is like a king who, before entering the city, is greeted by the townspeople who come out to meet him and receive him in the field. And then anyone who wants to can greet him. 
as he welcomes everyone with a pleasant face and smiles at everyone. This needs to be understood. How does this fit with what is written in the Torah? Torah, yeah, the Book of Jewish Law. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, that from Rish Chodesh Elul and onward, the shofar is sounded each day to warn the people to repent, as it is said, if a shofar is blown in the city while the people, will the people not be afraid? It seems that since in Elul the king receives everyone with a pleasant face and shows smiling faces to everyone, the main work of Elul is seemingly love, and even in even the repentance of Elul should be seemingly repentance out of love. So why is the shofar sounded then to arouse fear and trepidation? So if Elul is a time when Hashem is being merciful and showing up his smiling face, then why do we need the shofar? which elicits fear of heaven and people. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's a question. So yeah, if you want, yeah, cool. Amazing. I'm not sure how much you want to do. Do you want to end off on the question or? <laughs> Let's end off there because uh, my wife came home and, uh, you know, a good husband, he can't ignore his wife, but uh, nice, this nice. is good. We covered a lot of ground. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool, cool. Almost. All right, we'll learn again. I'll join a lot. It was a pleasure. Yeah, we'll have you again. That's All right. good. Good see, to you. see you. See you. Good night. Good night. Good morning, shall I say. All right, everyone. Well, um, thanks for joining. We may continue later tonight or tomorrow. We'll see. So in the meantime, um, have a good one. It's been good so far.